Good afternoon. My name is Raj Talsiani. Um, I have 20 minutes to try and explain to you what's taken me 22 years to learn, um, and frankly, which feels uh, slightly peripheral after what I've just heard. Um, I do three things. Um, I run a company called Mongoose, which uh, funds community projects fighting gang affiliation and uh, Wahhabi uh, radicalization in communities at threat. I have a social enterprise called Drive, which um, is a multi-strand inclusion uh, charity looking at trying to share best practice from around the world. Uh, and the reason I'm here is I'm the chairman and founder of a small company in London called Green Park. Uh, Green Park is 11 years old, 55 million uh, in sales, uh, most of that by pure luck, if truth be told. So um, who's not in the room today? So firstly, what I'm going to tell you is based largely on um, some research we've done um, with Operation Black Vote around the colour of power. Um, it also refers in some way to the excellent document you'll find out in the foyer by the Arts Council, which really does compare well to some of the work that has been done in other sectors. Um, it looks at our own research and taking on 6,000 um, professionals and our annual 100 BME on boards research. It also looks at one of the change makers um, dissertation, Susan Allen, who I don't believe can be here today, but she looked at the triple threat and the cement ceiling. So um, that's what it's based on. What you need to know is Generally, I'm going to upset about a third of you in this room. So I'm probably going to upset some of the sceptics in the sector. I'm certainly going to upset some of the um, prejudiced people who are uh, conscious blockers to change because they don't think anything needs to happen before they retire. There's a chance I'll upset some of the liberal elite whose dangerous but well-meaning group think stops um, co-creation with people with lived experience. And most controversially, I'm probably going to accept those people who are diverse themselves because they're stuck in the 80s, not helping the Dahl move. Um, most of what we do, and most of the organisations, and I would suspect the vast majority of organisations in this sector, fall in that first box. So that first box really, if you can see the bottom corner, there's a variable line which says start. And that variable line is there to manifest the fact that people don't really know where they are. They're not dealing with data, they're dealing with representation data. They're not dealing with perception, they're dealing with stories and anecdotes. And a big part of what I'll hope to share with you today might be levers to move your own organisations from really increasingly sophisticated narratives to much more meaningful numbers. And that could be numbers of people in your organisation, people not leaving your organisation, people being promoted in your organisation, customers, people being engaged in the arts. Most organisations are not out of that box. Where that box changes is after understanding there's an unconscious inertia and looking at the culture of the organisation, one looks at a clear purpose and a common language. So a little test for you, if you go back to your organisations and say, why is diversity or inclusion important to us? If you ask the people at the top of the organisation, generally by about number 15, there starts to be a bit of a divergence. Once you get down to number 50, it's like you're in a different place. So how can you possibly drive this through your culture and your operations and what your customers think of you if you don't have a common purpose and language yourselves? And then there is a role for data, but there's also a role for engagement. And that engagement needs to be co-created with exactly the kind of people who are not in the room right now. Every, well, for the last four years, using our algorithm, we've mapped the top 10,000 jobs in the FTSE 100 and the top 5,000 jobs in public life. We're about to uh, release something for the arts and third sector. Um, what we find is, although each organisation is unique, the patterns of behaviour actually are quite similar in many different organisations. Um, and this is manifested largely in an inability to do the dirty washing. So one has a kind of generation of leaders now who have become more and more adept at talking about equality and inclusion and saying it's on there, it's really important to them. But if you look at the underlying trends, both in terms of audience outside changes in demographics, and we do work with broadcasting, um, the people who sit on boards, the cultures of those boards, you'll find that actually the speed of change 
um, is nowhere near the speed of the narrative changing. And the effect this has is often, once we warm people up to things being different and they don't experience that in their own behaviours or their own programming, what we've done is we've started to create a disengagement. That's too boring even for me to go through it, right. <laughs> so, so um, 10 steps to moving the dial. I've got some examples. Um, number one, understanding the balance sheet. Now, this really um, is more about your own organisation and being honest. And honesty, of course, starts with some hard numbers. So there's some really, as I said, there's some good work that Abid and his team have done around representation, but that is only one single element of this. In our audit process, and of course we're not the only person, people to do this, and you can often do this yourself, this framework is free to anybody, and all of the stuff we do through our social enterprise is open source. Um, to look at not just best practice, but what's going to work for us, because each individual organisation has got a different mission and different capabilities. Um, what is your parent present state? Is there a recognition that diverse talent within the organisation and that has left the organisation has similar experiences? Um, what are the perceptions? Often this revolves around leadership. So I completely understand why the majority of white leaders have the Benedict Cumberbatch nightmare when using the word coloured instead of the word black can mean that you're totally exposed. But the reality of it is without a level of authenticity and without investing in diversity confidence, most of what people say is being increasingly ignored as people get more and more scepticism about the pace of change not moving quickly enough. Performance, well of course performance is one element in which you have a complete advantage around most other industries. And then prioritisation recruitment. I'll put in with recruitment proportionality. So this is an important word for you if you're not on the creative side, if you're actually facilitating the creators being able to do their job well and to inspire people, which is you know, if we bring people in, what's the proportional rate of them being promoted? If we're putting funds out, what's the proportional rate of that not just within our total mechanism of funding, but in our top 20? Where does the money go? If you follow the money, then you'll be able to grab the attention of those people who perhaps aren't as interested in some of the things that you might be. So don't invest a penny in diversity consultancy or any other form of strangers coming in and telling you how to run your organisations until you can answer these questions. If diversity is what you have, then inclusion is what you do with it. So unless you can answer what you want to do with it yourself, then paying somebody to come on board and regurgitate models that they've come up with elsewhere is not really going to give you any value. Similarly, the vast majority of organisations today are only interested in their own demand. Everything they do is around we want, we need, we can fix. But there isn't that co-creation of solutions with the people who are needed to balance that equation, which is the supply side. So again, unless you can do that, and in the arts you should have a tremendous advantage of being able to do that directly. And then how are you going to build trust? So here we've got the classic trust equation. Trust equals credibil credibility, reliability and intimacy divided by self-interest. Not minus self-interest, but divided by self-interest. So if your audience or the people you're trying to reach out to do not buy into your self-interest and it's not open and transparent, then actually your likelihood of moving trust is incredibly difficult, particularly in today's sceptical times. So some uncomfortable truths. You don't have to lower the bar, but you're probably going to have to do something to widen the gate. Statistically, and from a capability perspective, there's plenty of diverse talent out there across all of the strands. We put over 150 people on boards last year, and we are not a big player. We're a boutique. Um, there's lots of external preconceptions and internal groupthink. I'll give you an example of this. Um, just in December, two of my friends were appointed to the top jobs in educational um, establishments. One, we placed a uh, black man, we said, you know, this is an institutionally racist place. So before you sign up, be sure what you're going to do. They need you, the community needs you, but I don't want to give you a handball. The other one, 
a fantastic woman who's helped me for years, got a big job in Oxford. When I went to see them, they had exactly the same problem. And, and, and they're at completely different ends of the spectrum. And that, that problem was people had very strong preconceptions about why it wasn't for them. But in actual fact, what they needed to say is, what's the next 10 words? Which I've unashamedly borrowed from the West Wing. <laughs> Once you can get people to move past, oh, the arts isn't for me, or opera isn't for me, or, you know, I don't really, I don't really feel that that's something I could participate in, and get them to articulate their next ten words, then you scratch the surface. You've moved the conversation forward, and if it's done sensitively and often enough, that challenge will come back to you from your customers, or in their case, their students. Um, we did the most diverse board in the country for TFL, and the truth to that was... We said, you can have search and selection, just like any other headhunters will give you, and you know, we'll talk to 180 people, and you might like 10, and on we go. But actually, shouldn't you get something a bit more? Shouldn't you have candidate journeys that resonate with the individuals? Shouldn't you headhunt the best possible people for your problem? And again, you don't need a headhunter to do that. Many of your HR, for, um, many of your HR um, departments will be able to do an element of that for you. But this idea of bespoke candidate journeys, this idea of saying to someone like Ron Khalifa, who's a chairman and founder of WorldPay, who we put onto the TfL board, amongst eight others, Ron, I know you're not interested in train sets, but you are interested in the future of payments, aren't you? So what could be more interested than 19 million journeys a day? It's really important that advocacy and feedback are linked to your candidate experiences. When we put the CFO in at Network Rail, there were three women at the end and a, a, an, old, um, an old guy. Old guy was selected, I thought he was the best candidate. But we never would have got to that situation unless we were able to drive advocacy in the market, to get the opportunity to come off the page, but also for the problems and challenges to be honestly transferred into that marketplace so people could question. So people weren't winning a process, they were actually looking at how they could help. If you use the same processes and partners and expect more diverse results, you're in denial or possibly negligent. I'll tell you two quick stories as I've got six minutes and 50 seconds left. <laughs> Thank you, whoever that was. <laughs> okay, so uh, the second one first. I got called in to do a NED for a, um, a NHS Trust, quite a well-known one. The chap, the chairman, uh, and I didn't get on at all well. He effectively said, look, I don't want someone turning up and saying, you know, I'm the black Ned. I want someone turning up saying, I'm working for one of the most prestigious teaching hospitals in the country. I said, well, firstly, there's no guarantee that anyone of colour is going to be interested in your job. But more importantly, if it was a woman, would you want them to deny their gender first? So there was a bit of a tiff, as you can imagine. Um, and then about an hour later, I got a call and we got the piece of work, to which I said, I'm very surprised. I didn't think I built a good relationship with the chairman at all. The board secretary said, no, he noted that and he didn't think it was material. <laughs> so we took the work, but we insisted on an independent panel member that we put in at our expense. And the upshot of that was when the successful candidate, who is a woman of colour, um, before she came into the room, the language that was used was about, is she aggressive? Is she going to be assertive? How is she going to fit with our culture? So just as the speaker before um, the fantastic uh, poems were talking about microaggressions, this was this in real life. And when we played it back to them, they knew what the score was and they had to make the appointment. But it's, that's conscious bias. I personally think unconscious bias is a massive scam. Don't spend a penny on it. As the start of a conversation, you can do the Harvard implicity test for nothing online. It gives you the same results. But sometimes your panels are unconsciously biased. So we were doing a very, um, an organisation that every single person in this room would hear of. Uh, we placed their first women chair. When we came to the last four, there were two lords and these two fantastic, um, talented women. And they asked me what my feedback was. Um, and I said, when you talk about men, you talk about gravitas, you talk about fiscal capability, what effect they're going to have on your balance sheet. When you talk about women, you make it a popularity contest. How are they going to fit in? Will they be able to manage the complexity? I said, you can have one or the other. 
So um, fortunately, that went through as well. And we managed to keep that client, <coughs> a bad thing. Um, a piece of research we did yesterday, so, uh, sorry, last year. So each year we do a list of 100 BMEs on board from a network of 650 we track. And then we, at the same time we do that, we go to 6,000 business leaders and our 650. And what we saw last year was quite distressing in that um, the vast majority of people who um, were in that ethnic minority list, uh, who were already at board level, had experienced some form of overt racism. And these are people at the top of their organisation. So what must it be like when you're voiceless in the middle of an organisation? Um, and there's some statistics there about what they thought would have made the biggest difference. And 84% said stronger leadership and governance from the top. But governance is one of those words that gets used without any intent. That's too boring for me to go into as well. <laughs> so within this idea of governance, and particularly in your sector, one has to find a way of introducing the voice of the customer. Um, traditional ideas of governance, which are legal, fidgery, reputational, um, that's fine, and there's a place for that. But I suggest you've all got loads of that, right? What you also need is a new form of corporate stewardship, which includes the threat to your organisation, to your credibility, to the trust people have, to the communities that you serve, to digital threats, to the ability to reach out and take your product, which is amazing, into new markets. These are just as important for your future relevance as someone managing your audited accounts. And I believe a big part of that is a difference between role models, who are people who look different, who have big jobs, and real models, who are people who actually accept a responsibility to do more. They are not always right. They are not always right for each organisation. But the principle that they bring to the table is one of recognised authenticity, is one of already being successful and not taking the ladder up with them, is one of being authentic, and is also one of actually leading. So when people talk to me about leadership, I say, if you say you're a leader, who have you taken that wouldn't have gone there elsewhere? Would they have gone there without you? Did you create leaders behind you? Do you have followership? So all of these things have their place. But what's happening today is people are very hypocritical and patronising about not addressing this within an organisation. So although people can talk about the importance of boards, and they are critical, the value an organisation gives to its public is in the middle, and it's from the customer. So being challenging with your organisations and asking them about how diversity and inclusion affects our customer, how does it affect our reputation, how does it affect risk, these are the things that will engage and change the minds of the people who are at the top of that pyramid who are not going to be as connected to the reality of what your organisation does. And that is the same in the public, private and third sector. I put it to you that it might be similar in the arts. Thank you. <laughs>